Chapter Twelve of Up from Slavery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Newkirk. Up from Slavery by Booker T. Washington. Chapter Twelve. Chapter Twelve. Raising Money. When we opened our boarding department, we provided rooms in the attic of Porter Hall, our first building, for a number of girls. But the number of students of both sexes continued to increase. We could find rooms outside the school grounds for many of the young men, but the girls we did not care to expose in this way. Very soon the problem of providing more rooms for the girls, as well as a larger boarding department for all the students, grew serious. As a result, we finally decided to undertake the construction of a still larger building, a building that would contain rooms for the girls and boarding accommodations for all. After having had a preliminary sketch of the needed building made, we found that it would cost about $10,000. We had no money whatever with which to begin. Still we decided to give the needed building a name. We knew we could name it, even though we were in doubt about our ability to secure the means for its construction. We decided to call the proposed building Alabama Hall, in honor of the state in which we were laboring. Again Miss Davidson began making efforts to enlist the interest and help of the colored and white people in and near Tuskegee. They responded willingly, in proportion to their means. The students, as in the case of our first building, Porter Hall, began digging out the dirt in order to allow the laying of the foundations. When we seemed at the end of our resources, so far as securing money was concerned, something occurred which showed the greatness of General Armstrong, something which proved how far he was above the ordinary individual. When we were in the midst of great anxiety as to where and how we were to get funds for the new building, I received a telegram from General Armstrong asking me if I could spend a month traveling with him through the north, and asking me, if I could do so, to come to Hampton at once. Of course I accepted General Armstrong's invitation, and went to Hampton immediately. On arriving there I found that the General had decided to take a quartet of singers through the North, and hold meetings for a month in important cities, at which meetings he and I were to speak. Imagine my surprise when the General told me, further, that these meetings were to be held not in the interests of Hampton, but in the interests of Tuskegee, and that the Hampton Institute was to be responsible for all the expenses. Although he never told me so in so many words, I found that General Armstrong took this method of introducing me to the people of the North, as well as for the sake of securing some immediate funds to be used in the erection of Alabama Hall. A weak and narrow man would have reasoned that all the money which came to Tuskegee in this way would be just so much taken from the Hampton Institute. But none of these selfish or short-sighted feelings ever entered the breast of General Armstrong. He was too big to be little, too good to be mean. He knew that the people in the North who gave money gave it for the purpose of helping the whole cause of Negro civilization, and not merely for the advancement of any one school. The General knew, too, that the way to strengthen Hampton was to make it a center of unselfish power in the working out of the whole southern problem. In regard to the addresses which I was to make in the North, I recall just one piece of advice which the General gave me. He said, Give them an idea for every word. I think it would be hard to improve upon this advice, and it might be made to apply to all public speaking. From that time to the present I have always tried to keep his advice in mind. Meetings were held in New York, Brooklyn, Boston, Philadelphia, and other large cities, and at all of these meetings General Armstrong pleased, together with myself, for help, not for Hampton, but for Tuskegee. At these meetings an especial effort was made to secure help for the building of Alabama Hall, as well as to introduce the school to the attention of the general public. In both these respects the meetings proved successful. 
After that kindly introduction, I began going north alone to secure funds. During the last fifteen years, I had been compelled to spend a large proportion of my time away from the school, in an effort to secure money to provide for the growing needs of the institution. In my efforts to get funds, I have had some experiences that may be of interest to my readers. Time and time again I have been asked, by people who are trying to secure money for philanthropic purposes, what rule or rules I followed to secure the interest and help of people who were able to contribute money to worthy objects. As far as the science of what is called begging can be reduced to rules, I would say that I have had but two rules. First, always to do my whole duty regarding making our work known to individuals and organizations and second not to worry about the results. This second rule has been the hardest for me to live up to. When bills are on the eve of falling due, with not a dollar in hand with which to meet them, it is pretty difficult to learn not to worry, although I think I am learning more and more each year that all worry simply consumes, and to no purpose, just so much physical and mental strength that might otherwise be given to effective work. After considerable experience in coming into contact with wealthy and noted men, I have observed that those who have accomplished the greatest results are those who, quote, keep under the body, end quote, are those who never grow excited or lose self-control, but are always calm, self-possessed, patient, and polite. I think that President William McKinley is the best example of a man of this class that I have ever seen. In order to be successful in any kind of undertaking, I think the main thing is for one to grow to the point where he completely forgets himself, that is, to lose himself in a great cause. In proportion as one loses himself in the way, in the same degree does he get the highest happiness out of his work. My experience in getting money for Tuskegee has taught me to have no patience with those people who are always condemning the rich because they are rich and because they do not give more to objects of charity. In the first place, those who are guilty of such sweeping criticisms do not know how many people would be made poor and how much suffering would result if wealthy people were to part all at once with any large proportion of their wealth in a way to disorganize and cripple great business enterprises. Then very few persons have any idea of the large number of applications for help that rich people are constantly being flooded with. I know wealthy people who receive as much as twenty calls a day for help. More than once, when I have gone into the offices of rich men, I have found half a dozen persons waiting to see them, and all come for the same purpose, that of securing money. And all these calls in person, to say nothing of the applications received through the mails. Very few people have any idea of the amount of money given away by persons who never permit their names to be known. I have often heard persons condemned for not giving away money who, to my knowledge, were giving away thousands of dollars every year so quietly that the world knew nothing about it. As an example of this, there are two ladies in New York whose names rarely appear in print, but who, in a quiet way, have given us the means with which to erect three large and important buildings during the last eight years. Besides the gift of these buildings, they have made other generous donations to the school. And they not only help Tuskegee, but they are constantly seeking opportunities to help other worthy causes. Although it has been my privilege to be the medium through which a good many hundred thousand dollars have been received for the work at Tuskegee, I have always avoided what the world calls, quote, begging, end quote. I often tell people that I have never, quote, begged any money, and that I am not a, quote, beggar. My experience and observation have convinced me that persistent asking outright for money from the rich does not, as a rule, secure help. I have usually proceeded on the principle that persons who possess sense enough to earn money have sense enough to know how to give it away and that the mere making known of the facts regarding Tuskegee, and especially the facts regarding the work of the graduates, has been more effective than outright begging. 
I think that the presentation of facts on a high, dignified plane is all the begging that most rich people care for. While the work of going from door to door and from office to office is hard, disagreeable, and costly in bodily strength, yet it does have some compensations. Such work gives one a rare opportunity to study human nature. It also has its compensations in giving one an opportunity to meet some of the best people in the world. To be more correct, I think I should say the best people in the world. When one takes a broad survey of the country, he will find that the most useful and influential people in it are those who take the deepest interest in institutions that exist for the purpose of making the world better. At one time, when I was in Boston, I called at the door of a rather wealthy lady, and was admitted to the vestibule and sent up my card. While I was waiting for an answer, her husband came in, and asked me in the most abrupt manner what I wanted. When I tried to explain the object of my call, he became still more ungentlemanly in his words and manner, and finally grew so excited that I left the house without waiting for a reply from the lady. A few blocks from that house I called to see a gentleman who received me in the most cordial manner. He wrote me his check for a generous sum, and then, before I had an opportunity to thank him, said, I am so grateful to you, Mr. Washington, for giving me the opportunity to help a good cause. It is a privilege to have a share in it. We in Boston are constantly indebted to you for doing our work. My experience in securing money convinces me that the first type of man is growing more rare all the time, and that the latter type is increasing. That is, that more and more rich people are coming to regard men and women who apply to them for help for worthy objects, not as beggars, but as agents for doing their work. In the city of Boston I have rarely called upon an individual for funds that I have not been thanked for calling, usually before I could get an opportunity to thank the donor for the money. In that city the donors seem to feel, in a large degree, that an honor is being conferred upon them in their being permitted to give. Nowhere else have I met with, in so large a measure, this fine and Christ-like spirit as in the city of Boston, although there are many notable instances of it outside that city. I repeat my belief that the world is growing in the direction of giving. I repeat that the main rule by which I have been guided in collecting money is to do my full duty in regard to giving people who have money an opportunity for help. In the early years of the Tuskegee School, I walked the streets or traveled country roads in the north for days and days without receiving a dollar. Often as it happened, when during the week I had been disappointed in not getting a cent from the very individuals from whom I most expected help, and when I was almost broken down and discouraged, that generous help has come from someone who I had had little idea would give at all. I recall that on one occasion I obtained information that led me to believe that a gentleman who lived about two miles out in the country from Stamford, Connecticut, might become interested in our efforts at Tuskegee if our conditions and needs were presented to him. On an unusually cold and stormy day I walked the two miles to see him. After some difficulty I succeeded in securing an interview with him. He listened with some degree of interest to what I had to say, but did not give me anything. I could not help having the feeling that, in a measure, the three hours that I had spent in seeing him had been thrown away. Still I had followed my usual rule of doing my duty. If I had not seen him, I should have felt unhappy over neglect of duty. Two years after this visit a letter came to Tuskegee from this man, which read like this. Enclosed I send you a New York draft for ten thousand dollars to be used in furtherance of your work. I had placed this sum in my will for your school, but deem it wiser to give it to you while I live. I recall with pleasure your visit to me two years ago. I can hardly imagine any occurrence which could have given me more genuine satisfaction than the receipt of this draft. It was by far the largest single donation which up to that time the school had ever received. It came at a time when an unusually long period had passed since we had received any money. 
we were in great distress because of lack of funds and the nervous strain was tremendous it is difficult for me to think of any situation that is more trying on the nerves than that of conducting a large institution with heavy obligations to meet without knowing where the money is to come from to meet these obligations from month to month in our case i felt a double responsibility and this made the anxiety all the more intense if the institution had been officered by white persons and had failed it would have injured the cause of negro education but i knew that the failure of our institution officered by negroes would not only mean the loss of a school but would cause people in a large degree to lose faith in the ability of the entire race the receipt of this draft for ten thousand dollars under all these circumstances partially lifted a burden that had been pressing down upon me for days from the beginning of our work to the present i have always had the feeling and lose no opportunity to impress our teachers with the same idea that the school will always be supported in proportion as the inside of the institution is kept clean and pure and wholesome the first time i ever saw the late collis p huntington the great railroad man he gave me two dollars for our school the last time i saw him which was a few months before he died he gave me fifty thousand dollars toward our endowment fund between these two gifts there were others of generous proportions which came every year from both mr and mrs huntington some people may say that it was tuskegee's good luck that brought us this gift of fifty thousand dollars no it was not luck it was hard work nothing ever comes to me that is worth having except as the result of hard work when mr huntington gave me the first two dollars i did not blame him for not giving me more but made up my mind that i was going to convince him by tangible results that we were worthy of larger gifts for a dozen years i made a strong effort to convince mr huntington of the value of our work i noted that just in proportion as the usefulness of the school grew his donations increased never did i meet an individual who took a more kindly and sympathetic interest in our school than did mr huntington he not only gave money to us but took time in which to advise me as a father would a son about the general conduct of the school more than once i have found myself in some pretty tight places while collecting money in the north the following incident i have never related but once before for the reason that i feared that people would not believe it one morning i found myself in providence rhode island without a cent of money with which to buy breakfast in crossing the street to see a lady from whom i hoped to get some money I found a bright new twenty-five-cent piece in the middle of the street track. I not only had this twenty-five cents for my breakfast, but within a few minutes I had a donation from the lady on whom I had started to call. At one of our commencements I was bold enough to invite the Rev. E. Winchester Donald, D.D., rector of Trinity Church, Boston, to preach the commencement sermon as we then had no room large enough to accommodate all who would be present the place of meeting was under a large improvised arbor built partly of brush and partly of rough boards soon after dr donald had begun speaking the rain came down in torrents and he had to stop while someone held an umbrella over him the boldness of what i had done never dawned upon me until i saw the picture made by the rector of trinity church standing before that large audience under an old umbrella waiting for the rain to cease so that he could go on with his address it was not very long before the rain ceased and dr donald finished his sermon and an excellent sermon it was too in spite of the weather after he had gone to his room and had gotten the wet threads of his clothes dry dr donald ventured the remark that a large chapel at tuskegee would not be out of place the next day a letter came from two ladies who were then traveling in italy saying they had decided to give us the money for such a chapel as we needed a short time ago we received twenty thousand dollars from mr andrew carnegie to be used for the purpose of erecting a new library building 
Our first library and reading room were in a corner of a shanty, and the whole thing occupied a space about five by twelve feet. It required ten years of work before I was able to secure Mr. Carnegie's interest and help. The first time I saw him ten years ago, he seemed to take but little interest in our school, but I was determined to show him that we were worthy of his help. After ten years of hard work, I wrote him a letter reading as follows. December 15, 1900. Mr. Andrew Carnegie, 5 West 51st Street, New York. Dear Sir, Complying with the request which you made of me when I saw you at your residence a few days ago, I now submit in writing an appeal for a library building for our institution. We have 1,100 students, 86 officers and instructors together with their families, and about 200 colored people living near the school, all of whom would make use of the library building. We have over 12,000 books, periodicals, etc., gifts from our friends, but we have no suitable place for them, and we have no suitable reading room. Our graduates go to work in every section of the South, and whatever knowledge might be obtained in the library would serve to assist in the elevation of the whole Negro race. Such a building as we need could be erected for about $20,000 all of the work for the building such as brick making brick masonry carpentry blacksmithing etc would be done by the students the money which you would give would not only supply the building but the erection of the building would give a large number of students an opportunity to learn the building trades and the students would use the money paid to them to keep themselves in school I do not believe that a similar amount of money often could be made to go so far in uplifting a whole race. If you wish further information, I shall be glad to furnish it. Yours truly, Booker T. Washington, Principal. The next mail brought back the following reply. I will be very glad to pay the bills for the library building as they are incurred to the extent of twenty thousand dollars, and I am glad of this opportunity to show the interest I have in your noble work. I have found that strict business methods go a long way in securing the interest of rich people. It has been my constant aim at Tuskegee to carry out, in our financial and other operations, such business methods as would be approved of by any New York banking house. I have spoken of several large gifts to the school, but by far the greater proportion of the money that has built up the institution has come in the form of small donations from persons of moderate means. It is upon these small gifts, which carry with them the interest of hundreds of donors, that any philanthropic work must depend largely for its support. In my efforts to get money I have often been surprised at the patience and deep interest of the ministers who are besieged on every hand and at all hours of the day for help. If no other consideration had convinced me of the value of the Christian life, the Christ-like work which the Church of all denominations in America has done during the last thirty-five years for the elevation of the black man would have made me a Christian. In a large degree it has been the pennies, the nickels, and the dimes which have come from the Sunday schools, the Christian Endeavor Societies, and the Missionary Societies, as well as from the Church proper, that have helped to elevate the Negro at so rapid a rate. This speaking of small gifts reminds me to say that very few Tuskegee graduates fail to send us an annual contribution. These contributions range from twenty-five cents up to ten dollars. Soon after beginning our third year's work, we were surprised to receive money from three special sources, and up to the present time we have continued to receive help from them. First, the state legislature of Alabama increased its annual appropriation from $2,000 to $3,000. I might add that still later it increased this sum to $4,500 a year. The effort to secure this increase was led by the Hon. M. F. Foster, the member of the legislature from Tuskegee. Second, we received $1,000 from the John F. Slater Fund. Our work seemed to please the trustees of this fund, as they soon began increasing their annual grant. 
This has been added to from time to time until at present we receive $11,000 annually from the fund. The other help to which I have referred came in the shape of an allowance from the Peabody Fund. This was at first $500, but it has since been increased to $1,500. The effort to secure help from the Slater and Peabody funds brought me into contact with two rare men, men who have had much to do in shaping the policy for the education of the Negro. I refer to the Honorable J. L. M. Curry of Washington, who is the general agent for these two funds, and Mr. Morris K. Jessup of New York. Dr. Curry is a native of the South, an ex-Confederate soldier, yet I do not believe there is any man in the country who is more deeply interested in the highest welfare of the Negro than Dr. Curry, or one who is more free from race prejudice. He enjoys the unique distinction of possessing to an equal degree of confidence of the black man and the southern white man. I shall never forget the first time I met him. It was in Richmond, Virginia, where he was then living. I had heard much about him. When I first went into his presence, trembling because of my youth and inexperience, he took me by the hand so cordially and spoke such encouraging words and gave me such helpful advice regarding the proper course to pursue that I came to know him then, as I have known him ever since, as a high example of one who is constantly and unselfishly at work for the betterment of humanity. Mr. Morris K. Jessup, the treasurer of the Slater Fund, I refer to because I know of no man of wealth and large and complicated business responsibilities who gives not only money but his time and thought to the subject of the proper method of elevating the Negro to the extent that is true of Mr. Jessup. It is very largely through this effort and influence that during the last few years the subject of industrial education has assumed the importance that it has, and has been placed on its present footing. End of chapter 12. Recording by Carol Newkirk.